This is the canopy world. This is, this is the third dimension of the forest. This is the place where birds fly. This is the sort of the aspect of, of pollen floating through the forest. This is where the rain starts flowing through the forest before it hits the ground. And it's the place where these amazing plants, these mosses, these ferns, grow not on the forest floor, but up in this third dimension. It's, it's the last biotic frontier. When people ask me when did I first do this tree stuff, I, I really have to go back to my early, early childhood. My parents had this wonderful house with, with two and a half acres of land, and the driveway in front of the house was lined with eight maple trees. And pretty much every day I'd come home from school, I would choose one of those eight trees and say, okay, it's, it's number two's turn, I'm gonna go up that tree. And I, I really think it was sort of held in the limbs of those trees by myself watching the world go by underneath me that I, that's really where it began, where I felt safe with this tree, I felt interested in the tree, I would watch squirrels going back and forth. The seasons would change as I would experience this tree. The fall would bring leaf fall, the spring would bring new green leaves to me. And so it was then I think that I decided I want to do something in my life that involves trees. When I met my husband-to-be, Jack Longineau, the love of my life, uh, we were both doing rainforest ecology in Costa Rica. We met, uh, he was studying ants, I was studying trees. Actually, his first line to me was, I really want to know if there are ants in those treetops. And I mean, what a line, what girl could refuse that? And so that was sort of the beginning of our relationship. And we actually ended up marrying ourselves uh, in, in the crown of a very tall tropical tree at his field site. I think there are lots of reasons to care about trees at a very, very sort of elementary or physical basis. It is trees that provide us with the very air that we breathe, the oxygen that we breathe. They sequester carbon dioxide. Then with the amount of carbon dioxide we're putting into the air, it's very important that we keep as many trees on this planet as possible. Yeah, you can go a bit to, towards your right. They've inspired art and music and poetry and writing through the ages across cultures. And finally, I think we have to think about trees because of the spiritual connection that we have with them. That when we walk in a forest like this, our eyes are drawn upward, just like our eyes are drawn upward in a cathedral. Oh ho, here's your litter fall track. Yes. Looks so there's a dead fern in there already, a polypodium. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. That's a licorice fern. Yes. There's a pool of stored nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus and so forth, in these mosses and in the soils that accumulate in the canopy. When those epiphytes die and fall off and fall down to the forest floor and start undergoing decomposition and making those nutrients available to the trees and the elk and so forth, that's what she's trying to understand with these, this litter trap. People haven't done this with a forest canopy because that's sort of the unknown world. People just haven't examined it. But in a forest like this, you can look around and see the, so many, so much in the way of mosses. Like, of course we need to know that. Of course we need to know that if we're to understand how this forest is working. What happens with global climate change? What happens when this forest is going to encounter longer dry seasons? How is that going to affect these mosses that are growing in the trees? And so if that changes, if that dynamic of the, of the atmosphere changes, then the dynamic of the forest as a whole may change too. There were kind of two forces in my life. One of them was climbing trees and loving being in the forest, and the other was modern dance. And so when I came out of college, there were these two sort of conflict, what seemed like conflicting things, which were, you know, go study forest ecology and go do modern dance. But, you know, when I, sometimes when I'm climbing trees and I have to get over a branch or under a log or, 
is that modern dance comes into it also. So it's funny that even though I chose field biology, I've sort of ended up with this combination of, of field biology and science, which I love, but also with this element of, of movement and the arts and awareness of three-dimensional space, which of course every modern dancer needs to know about. The tree is my stage and these mosses are my audience, whether they like it or not. <laughs> I think some of the most amazing things about trees that I've learned as a scientist, some of the most amazing biological things about trees, involve the fact they are immobile. They are rooted in the ground, and yet they have to deal with, a, with an environment that's changing all the time. So they can't go run to a faucet and get water. They have to somehow evolutionarily have adaptations that allow them to hunt for water in the ground, in the soil. We realize that there's actually this network of roots that range from something the size of my arm to tendrils of root hairs that are just a few cell layers thick. And by that network, that water is taken up and moved to the tops of the trees in sort of a water highway, an invisible water highway. The power of the sun moves water up the vessels, up the xylem, up the phloem of the tree, carrying with it the water and the dissolved minerals that are in the water that, that is in the soil. And a root that encounters that water is able to suck that up, not from some sort of muscle you know, that the root has, it doesn't have any muscles like we do, but that, that little bit of water is connected to the next little bit of water, which is connected to the next little bit of water, all the way up to the surface of the leaf. Leaves are exposed to the sun, and there's evaporation going on at the surface of the leaf. But basically it's this hydraulic lifting, as it's called, this tension pulling up um, from the leaf surface area all the way through down through the vascular system, like the blood vessels, except they're water vessels of the tree that are inside the tree that go all the way down to the roots. There are literally thousands of gallons of water that are moving up through the tree. And that helps to cool the the atmosphere so when you cut down trees you're losing that transpiration and you can get flooding because the trees aren't doing their job of moving that water up into the atmosphere. I believe there is a crisis in trees at this at this point of our lives and the lives of the planet. Of course it's related to the rising population of the whole world but when I look around at the trees that are being cut down for lumber, for paper, for goods and services that we seem to require here in the West especially, um, that's where I see the crisis as, as the driver. I think the greatest threat is indifference uh, taking me for granted as a tree. I mean what could be more heroic than reducing what's going on in terms of global climate change. It's trees that are doing that. But a tree does it not by journeying forward, but rather by staying put, by taking advantage of the resources that are within its scope. That is, how far it can reach out with its roots, how far out its branches and leaves can, can soak up the carbon dioxide and the sunlight. Those are heroic deeds. What keeps me hopeful about trees in the face of these disasters, these changes in tree viability and the increase in tree damage, the vast areas that have been deforested by humans, I think what keeps me hopeful is, is my knowledge, my experience and my sense that trees are deeply connected to humans and humans are deeply connected to trees. Trees have trunks, people have trunks. Trees have crowns, people have crowns. Trees have limbs, people have limbs. And I have faith. It's not a religious faith, but it is a faith that because of that deep connection between trees and humans, between humans and trees, that we will find ways to keep trees more healthy, more vibrant, and more a part of our lives than they are right now.
I have an ant named after me, and uh, my husband is an ant taxonomist. He collects and classifies ants. And one of the things he did when he proposed was he said that he would name an ant after me. And I, I thought that was so romantic. I mean, what, how could you pass that up? So he did. The ant's name is Procryptoceros nalini. And as Jack says, it's an elegant canopy ant, which I think is just so charming.